ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد so carrying on then with our fiqh lessons we're on the topic of the nullifiers of wudu the different types of things that break your wudu and today then we were going to look at a few different topics one of them is vomit does vomiting break your wudu one of them is blood nosebleeds that type of thing does it break your wudu uh, also certain types of meat does eating camel meat break your wudu what about lamb sheep the various types of meat do any of them break your wudu if you eat them those are a few of the topics we're going to look at today there is a hadith mentioned by ibn majah and in the musnad of al-imam ahmad and there is some weakness in this narration but it mentions al-hafiz ibn hajar mentioned it in bulugh al-maram hadith of aisha radiyallahu anha that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said man asabahu qay aw ru'af aw qalas aw madhi falyansarif wal yatawadha thumma liyabni ala salatihi wa huwa fi dhalika la yatakallam this narration mentions four things four things it mentions vomit it mentions blood like nosebleeds it mentions the qalas the qalas is when you vomit before the actual food comes up there is a liquid that exits first that was at the top of the stomach etc the liquid comes out first then the food follows on that liquid that exits first is that a nullifier of the wudu and the mavi we already spoke about that the pre-seminal fluid these four things in this narration it says if any of these four occur then go and make wudu meaning your wudu is broken with these four things if any of these four things occur the vomit the bleeding the nosebleed the uh, uh, liquid that comes out just before the vomit and the pre-seminal fluid then go and make wudu that's what the hadith says and then come and complete your prayer and do not speak in between this narration highlights a few things firstly something that we already covered last time the pre-seminal fluid regarding that there is no difference of opinion pre-seminal fluid there is no difference of opinion that is agreed upon by the scholars that pre-seminal fluid is a nullifier of wudu and that we mentioned last time already that is by consensus of the scholars secondly though the other items vomit and the liquid before the vomit and nosebleeds what is the ruling on those three items this narration indicates all three of those items break the wudu al qay wal ra'af wal qalas kullun minha yanqadu al wudu wa hiya kharija min baqiyati al jism ghayr al farjain 
وَهِيَ نَجِسَةً So these are the items, their exit from the person outside of the two passages. Whatever exits from the two passages, the private areas, that breaks the wudu. But these things, vomit and the liquid before the vomit and the nosebleed, obviously they are items exiting from the body, but not from those two passages. And that's where you start getting differences. These are items exiting from the body, but not from the two passages. These exit from the mouth, from the nose, from other areas. But as Sheikh Al-Fawzan says, that these would be considered as impure. Vomit and the liquid prior to the vomit and the nosebleed, all of these types of things would be considered as impure. فَالْقَيْءْ نَجِسْ لِأَنَّهُ خَارِجٌ مِنَ الْمَعِدَةِ بَعْدَ أَنْ تَخَمَّرَ فِي الْمَعِدَةِ وَتَغَيَّرْ وَكَذَلِكَ الْقَلَسْ لِأَنَّهُ نَوْعٌ مِنَ الْقَيْءْ So vomit would be considered impure because it has been digested in the stomach and all of the other chemicals within the stomach that have mixed in with it now. And after that digestion with all of those chemicals, now it exits from the body that is considered impure. And the liquid that exits prior to the actual content of the vomit that is also from the same area, from the same place, that would be considered impure to the Sheikh says. And nosebleeds, according to the Sheikh so far, he says would also be considered impure. And the narration indicates all of these things break the wudu, Even though they do not exit from the two passageways, they exit from elsewhere, but due to them all being from the impurities, that they break wudu, that's what the hadith indicates. When you study hadith in fiqh, when you study hadith in fiqh, they say to you, look at the hadith, Regardless of uh, uh, chains of narration and those things, they'll say to you, look at this narration and tell us what is the fiqh that you can derive from this particular narration. From this particular narration, the fiqh that we derive is that pre-seminal fluid breaks the wudu, agreed upon anyway, and that vomit and the liquid prior to vomit and nosebleeds also break wudu. That is the fiqh derived from this hadith. وَقَدْ ذَهَبَ إِلَى هَذَا أَحْمَدْ وَجَمَاعَةً إِلَى أَنَّ الْخَارِجَ النَّجِسَ الْكَثِيرَ يَنْقُضُ الْوُضُوْ وَلَوْ لَمْ يَخْرُجْ مِنَ السَّبِيلِهِ And Al-Imam Ahmed, Al-Imam Ahmed and a group of the scholars, they took this opinion, this opinion that says, remember the normal standard kind of opinion is that anything that exits from the two passages breaks your wudu. Outside of the two passages isn't in the default. But here, Ahmed and other scholars do have an opinion that if something impure exits from the body, a decent amount of it, not a tiny amount, a reasonable amount of something impure exits from the body even if it is not from the two passages, it still breaks your wudu. Whereas other scholars will say, no, if it doesn't exit from the two passageways, uh, exits from your mouth or nose, these things don't break your wudu. But Al-Imam Ahmed and a group of them do take this opinion. If it is impure, and there's a reasonable amount of it that exits, even if it's from other than the two passages, it breaks the wudu. 
If it was from the two passages, then we don't have any difference of opinion. If it's from the two passages, it breaks your wudu. But here the issue is, these items coming out from other than the two passages, from your mouth, from your nose, the nosebleed, the vomit, from your mouth. So Al-Imam Ahmed takes this opinion, it breaks your wudu. Vomit and nosebleeds of a reasonable amount that comes out, and the, the pre-vomit liquid, all of those things are impure according to a group of scholars, and therefore if they exit even outside of the two pathways, they break your wudu. And their evidence is obviously this hadith that we just read. This hadith indicates exactly that opinion and that position. But the Shafi'iyya and the Malikiyya, they believe that this vomit and the pre-vomit liquid and the nosebleeds, they do not break your wudu because they did not exit from one of the two passageways, meaning your private parts, rear and front. They did not exit from either of the passageways. And so they are not considered as nullifiers of the wudu. So they say even if it is vomit, even if it is the pre-vomit liquid, whatever they call it, even if it is the nosebleed or any other blood, nosebleed or blood from anywhere else, these items, if they exit from a person, not from his two passageways, then they do not break the wudu. And you could think about it the other way as well. Some scholars, they say, if the items that normally exit from the two passageways, if they were to exit from the body via a route other than the two passageways, it would still be considered a nullifier. Some other scholars mentioned that. Imagine somebody has a wound, some type of wound and some of that uh, fecal matter, etc., exits the feces, the urine, then they would say that is still a nullifier, even though it didn't exit from the biological passageways. Here, a Sheikh Al-Fawzan says the correct opinion from these two opinions, regarding vomit and the liquid before the vomit and the nosebleed, the correct opinion is the opinion that the Shafi'is and the Malikis mentioned, which is that these things do not break your wudu. And one of the reasons is, as many scholars said, the hadith that Al-Imam Ahmad relies upon, and other scholars rely upon, to say that they do break your wudu, the one that we just read, is actually a weak hadith, as we mentioned. Many of the scholars, they say, this is a weak hadith. And it opposes the behavior of the companions. The companions never used to consider vomit and these things and nosebleeds as nullifiers of the wudu. And there are narrations when blood exited from the companions and they never used to go make wudu again. So it contradicts the actions of the companions. Their actions indicate that they never viewed these things as nullifiers of the wudu, because there are narrations when these things happened to them and they didn't go make wudu. So the correct opinion is, these items do not break your wudu. The Shaykh gives an example, فَقَدْ كَانَتْ تُصِيبُهُمُ الْجَرَاحَاتِ وَتَنْزِفُ مِنْهُمُ الدِّمَاءِ وَلَمْ يُعْرَفْ عَنْهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَتَوَضَّأُونَ مِنْ أَجْلِ ذَلِكَ وَقَدْ جُرِحَ عُمَرَ بْنَ الْخَطَّابِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ وَسَالَتْ مِنْهُ الدِّمَاءِ وَلَمْ يَنْصَرِفْ مِنْ صَلَاتِهِ بَلْ أَتَمَّهَا جَمَاعَةً مَعَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ بَعْدَ أَنْ اسْتَخْلَفَ مِنْ مَنْ يُصَلِّي بِهِمْ فَلَوْ كَانَ خُرُوجُ الدَّمِّ مِنَ الْجِسْمِ نَاقِضًا لِلْوُضُوءِ لَانْصَرَفَ عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ مِنْ صَلَاتِهِ وَلَمْ يُتِمَّهَا There are examples and narrations about blood Remember it was vomit, the pre-vomit liquid and blood. There's some examples about the blood from the companions where they were afflicted with injuries in battle, for example. 
There are narrations where some of them were praying in, in jihad. Prayer is still obligated even in jihad. There's a different method of praying though. The method of how you pray when you're in jihad is different to the normal prayer. But the prayer is still established. So they were praying some of them. And it's mentioned about how the enemy arrows would come and strike them. They were praying and the arrow came and hit them in the leg. And that they would continue their prayer. And finish it whilst the blood was coming out from where that arrow had hit them. If that blood was a nullifier of the wudu, they would have to break off, go make wudu and pray again. And yet in those battles, the narrations they mentioned, they were struck by objects, arrows, uh, uh, and blood was exiting from them. And they never broke off their prayers, they carried on, proving that blood coming out of your body, nosebleed or anything, that doesn't break your wudu, some type of injury or nosebleed. And there is the famous example, of course, of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu, he was leading the prayer when he was stabbed. He was leading the prayer and he was stabbed. And obviously when he was stabbed, when you read the books of history, he was stabbed severely. Severely. Uh, they mentioned that the dagger was a double-sided dagger. Double-sided dagger, one blade, one blade. On both sides, not just a knife. Double-sided dagger with blades on either side. And he was stabbed deeply. Deep wounds. And the blood, they say in the biographies and in the history books, the words they use are like gushing out. That the blood was gushing out of him. They say even afterwards when they gave him milk to drink, he drank the milk and it came out of the wound. That was how he was stabbed at the time. But the point is, when he was stabbed and he was leading the prayer, somebody else came and took over the leading of the prayer, but he carried on and finished his prayer. With all of that blood, it didn't break his wudu. He didn't break off his prayer. So these kinds of examples indicate that blood, having a nosebleed or anything like that, or if you had some injury and there was a plaster or, or, or something more strapped on and it started bleeding whilst you're in the prayer, blood and those things do not break your wudu. Somebody recently sent me a question about uh, mucus, that if you're in the prayer and you sneeze or, or you have like a cold or whatever and all the mucus is coming out of your nose, doesn't break your wudu. That mucus exiting from your nose does not break your wudu. So the correct opinion on these issues is that they do not break your wudu. They do not break your wudu. And there is a difference of opinion about the blood, whether it's considered as impure in the first place, whether it is considered impure or not in the first place. Then also, as a side point, the hadith mentioned that when a person... Breaks his wudu, it said, Falyan sarif. Then break off your prayer and go. That part of the narration, even though the narration is weak, that part, no problem, that's agreed upon. There are narrations in other ahadith that highlight if your wudu breaks and you're in the prayer, then you stop and go. Stop your prayer, break your prayer, go and make wudu. But then the hadith also said, that when you come back, you're praying now, Dhuhr for example, and you've done two raka'at, you've done the tashahud, you're standing up in your third raka'ah, and wind breaks. So now, you walk off, you make wudu. This hadith says, come back and start from where? Huh? Where you left off, where you left off in your third raka'ah. So you're just going to pray two more. Your first two, your tashahud, your first two, you completed them. Your wudu broke when you were in your third raka'ah. This hadith says, come back and carry on from the third raka'ah. But from the moment you break off and go and make wudu and come back, you cannot speak. That's what the narration says. That's what is highlighted here. But as we said, it's a weak narration. And that is 
uh, a problematic aspect of it because that is not the correct ruling when it comes to that. The correct ruling is that if your wudu breaks in the prayer, then you go make your wudu again and when you come back you must begin from fresh. You must repeat the full prayer. Even if you were in Dhuhr prayer, for example, and you pray all of it, you're in your final tashahud, and your wudu breaks, then you have to go make wudu and pray the whole prayer again. You do not continue from where you left off. Then, the issue of certain types of meat. Does your wudu break if you eat certain types of meat? There is a hadith of Jabir ibn Samura, رضي الله عنه, أن رجلا سأل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم, that a man asked the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, أتوضأ من لحوم الغنم? Do I have to repeat my wudu if I eat sheep? Qala in shi'ta. The messenger said, if you wish. If you wish. Qal atawadda'u min luhum al-ibl. Then the man said to the messenger, do I have to make my wudu again if I eat camel meat? This time the messenger said, Qala na'am. Yes. So you see two different answers. When the man was asking about sheep, lamb, do I have to make wudu again if I eat that? The messenger said, if you want. Meaning it doesn't break your wudu. But if you want, you can go make wudu. The the fact that the messenger was giving this man a choice, it's up to you if you want indicates that he could choose not to make wudu and that would be okay. So sheep, lamb, that kind of thing does not break your wudu if you eat it. But then the man asked about camel meat and this time the messenger said to him, not a choice, he said, yes. Yes, you must make wudu when eating the camel meat. There is even another narration where the messenger said, لا توضأوا من لحوم الغنم Do not make wudu again from the meat of sheep. Do not make wudu again from that meat. That does not break your wudu. But what does break your wudu is the camel meat. And this is the opinion of Imam Ahmed and a large group of the scholars of hadith, the muhaddithun, that when you eat Camel, it breaks your wudu. يَرَوْنَ أَنَّ أَكْلَ لُحُومِ الْإِبْلِ يَنْقُضُ الْوُضُ وَالْإِمَامُ شَافِعِي يَقُولْ إِنْ صَحَّ الْحَدِيثِ قُلْتُ بِهِ وَقَدْ صَحَّ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم. So, Imam Ahmed views this, that eating camel meat breaks your wudu. Al-Imam Shafi'i said about this, if the hadith is authentic, then that's the opinion I would take. And this hadith is authentic. The hadith is authentic. So, you see here from a group of the scholars that it breaks your wudu. The question is, why would eating camel meat break your wudu? Why would it be the case that if you have camel meat, that it invalidates your wudu, you have to go make wudu again before you can pray? Why would that be the case? Anyone? Huh? Uh-huh. That there is some type of connection between the camels and the way they were created to shape on. Anyone else? Characteristics of a camel. Um, is it, could it be because camel meat is very warm? So do you do my cool you slightly? Camel meat is warm. 
And so making the wudu cools you down. Who's laughing? Somebody was laughing. We're going to get to that. He's got a point. Somebody else? Ibadah mahda, يعني, okay? But it's an act of worship. There is no reason that we know. That's possible. Some acts of worship, we don't know the reason. We don't know why you're supposed to do this worship in that particular way. But you do it because that is the way the command has come. Maybe that's one of those. We don't know the reason why, but the command is there. We do it. You said? Uh, Kamal's characteristics. The characteristics. These are some of the things the scholars have mentioned about the heat and the characteristics and the shaitan. All of them are linked. And you'll see here, a Shaykh al-Fawzan says, مَا الْحِكْمَةِ فِي كَوْنِ لُحُومِ الْإِبِلْ تَنْقُضُ الْوُضُوءِ إِذَا أَكَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ So what is the wisdom behind this? That if you eat camel meat, it breaks your wudu. هَذَا مَحَلْ بَحْث This is something to research into. It is a point of research. And meaning the scholars have researched into this point. They've researched into this topic. Why would camel meat break your wudu? الأقوال, and the shaykh says maybe the, the most accurate of these statements that the scholars have concluded upon. وَبِهَذَا فَإِنَّ لُحُومَهَا قَدْ يَكُونُ فِيهَا الشَّيْءٍ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْغِلْضَةِ وَالشِّدَّةِ وَالْإِنسَانِ عِنْدَمَا يَأْكُلُ لُحُومَ الْإِبِلِ رُبَّمَا يَتَأَثَّرُ مِنْ صِفَاتِ الْإِبِلِ لِذَا كَانَ يَنْبَغِي لَهُ أَنْ يَسْتَعْمِلَ مُضَادًا لِهَذِهِ الصِفَاتِ فَالشِّدَّةِ وَالْغِلْضَةِ مِنْ الشَّيْطَانِ وَالشَّيْطَانِ مِنْ نار وَلَا يُطْفِئُ النَّارِ إِلَّا الْمَاءِ لِذَا فَإِنَّهُ لَا يُطْفِئُ الشِّدَّةِ وَالْغِلْضَةِ الَّتِي فِي لُحُومِ الْإِبْلِ إِلَّا الْمَاءِ The Sheikh says that the most accurate opinion is that eating camel meat breaks your wudu because camels, the animals, camels, they have in their nature, in their character of camels, they are uh, considered and known amongst the Arabs as being an emotional animal. Camels are an emotional animal. They demonstrate anger. They demonstrate anger and uh, severity in their affair. Uh, the Arabs, they mention that if you do something wrong to a camel, it comes after you and it remembers that they have this emotion, the camels in them. So as a consequence of this emotion and severity that camels have in their nature, the way they are created, then if a person eats the camel meat, it is possible that some of those characteristics, you take them in to yourself via that camel meat. And so in order to neutralize those characteristics that are inherent within the camels of severity and harshness, to neutralize that, you need to make wudu. Because those characteristics of severity and harshness and that extreme type of emotion, it is from the shaitan. Those characteristics are from the shaitan. And shaitan is created from... If he's from the jinn, from the fire. And so nothing neutralizes fire other than water. So to neutralize those characteristics of the camel which are derived from the shaitan who is made of fire, you need to now use water. And so after eating camel meat, a person uses the water to neutralize any remnants or impacts or effects from the inherent nature of the camel, from that camel meat entering into you. This is an opinion and ijtihad of the scholars on this topic. 
The hadith doesn't say that. The hadith doesn't tell us that's the reason why. But the scholars have examined and analyzed and from all of their analysis, this appears to be the strongest opinion. Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned this in his works. That this appears to be the reason why maybe the legislation tells us to make wudu after eating camel meat. Uh, and they say this is similar, this is similar to the ruling of anger. What is the sunnah? One of the acts of sunnah, if a person becomes extremely overtaken by anger, one of the acts of the sunnah is that you're supposed to go and make wudu. And there are a few others, if you're in extreme anger in the sunnah, it mentions sit down. And uh, lie down. And various things are mentioned. Now one of them is make wudu. If that extreme anger overcomes you. So they say this is a similar concept. You have these extreme emotions in the camel. You're eating that meat. You're going to go make wudu then. Just like in the sunnah. If you yourself are overcome by anger. Then you make the wudu to cool that anger within you. Because anger is from the Shaytan also. وَهَذِهِ هِيَ الْحِكْمَةِ وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمْ فِي الْوُضُوءِ مِنْ لُحُومِ الْإِبَلِ لِمَا فِيهَا مِنَ الشِّدَّةِ وَالطَّيْشِ نَتِيجَةً لِطَبِيعَةِ الْإِبَلِ وَخِلْقَتِهَا بِخِلَافِ الْغَنَمْ The sheep, the messenger said, it's up to you. It doesn't break your wudu basically. Because sheep, those animals, their nature is Calm. The nature of sheep is to be calm. Whereas the nature of camels is aggression. There is a difference in the animals and the way they are. وَلِذَلِكَ تَجِدُ بِأَنَّ هُنَالِكَ فَرْقًا بَيْنَ رُعَاتِ الْغَنَمْ وَرُعَاتِ الْإِبْلِ And that's why the Shaykh says you find amongst the, the, uh, uh, the people who look after sheep, Compared to the people who look after camels, those people in their characters you see differences. Those who look after the sheep have the cool, calm, collected characters. Whereas those looking after the camels, to look after the camels, they have to be a level of aggression in them and a level of uh, a stern character to look after these stern animals. So that impacts upon the people also. Uh, ولهذا جاء في الحديث أنه ما من نبي إلا وراع الغنم and that's why it's mentioned in a hadith that all of the prophets and messengers they were shepherds of sheep they had that cool, calm, collected character all of the prophets and messengers they were shepherds of sheep فموسى عليه السلام موسى عليه السلام was a shepherd of sheep that's mentioned in the Quran Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before he became a prophet was a shepherd of sheep. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself before he became a prophet he did used to look after sheep also. وَذَلِكَ لِمَا فِي الْغَنَمِ مِنَ الْهُدُوءِ نعم فراعيها يتعلم الهدوء والسكينة ويتخلق بالهدوء والسكينة ولأن الأغنام ضعيفة so all of this indicates how the characteristics of those animals, they can affect you. And so the aggression and sternness that is in camels could affect you. And so it breaks your wudu, you have to go make it again uh, to cool that effect of that meat. So it is the opinion of a group of the scholars, Al-Imam Ahmad and others, that eating camel meat breaks your wudu. You have to go make it again before you can pray. And this is in fact the opinion of the majority of the muhaddithin. The majority of the scholars of hadith, their opinion is that camel meat breaks your wudu. As for Abu Hanifa, Malik and Shafi'i, because Shafi'i said in a statement, if the hadith is authentic, that's my opinion, but maybe it appears he did not recognize that the hadith is authentic. So it's mentioned about Abu Hanifa, Malik and Shafi'i, rahimahumullah, 
that as far as they were concerned, their opinion was camel meat does not break your wudu. Camel meat does not break your wudu. وَيَرَوْنَ أَنَّ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ مَنْسُوخ And they believe that this narration, because it's a clear narration, the man asking the messenger, do I have to make wudu if I eat sheep? Messenger says, it's up to you. Then he says, what about if I eat camels? The messenger says, yes, definitely then. Clear. But some of them, Shafi'i Malik, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, they say the hadith is abrogated. Mansukh. Abrogated, meaning that the narration is authentic. It's correct. But then later on, another narration came, another hadith came that overrides that one. Because as you know, the religion of Islam was not given to the messenger all in one go. Jibreel alayhi salam didn't come to the messenger with everything in one go. This is the religion of Islam. Rather, Jibreel alayhi salam used to come to the messenger bit by bit. Over a period of 23 years, bit by bit, coming with new parts of the religion, bit by bit. So sometimes he would come with a ruling, there would be a ruling given to the messenger, and then maybe years later, a new ruling was given to him, which meant that the old one was no longer valid. A new ruling came, that now takes the place of the old one, that's no longer valid. An example like we mentioned before, with intimacy, <clears throat> with intimacy between the spouses, it used to be the ruling in the early stages of Islam, that even if the intimate areas make contact, between the spouses, their intimate areas make contact, that ghusl is not required. That it was only required initially if actual seminal fluid or other fluids exited, or, or if not that, naam, if actual seminal fluids exited. If actual fluids exited, then ghusl was required initially. Just the mere contact of the intimate areas, ghusl was not required initially. But then now we know, later on in Islam, the new ruling came, إِذَا الْتَقَ الْخِتَانَانْ فَقَدْ وَجَبَ الْغُسَلْ That if the intimate areas make contact, regardless of any uh, uh, exiting of liquid or seminal fluid or anything, the intimate areas make contact, now it is obligatory to make so that ruling now wipes out the previous one. So sometimes that happened. In the early stages of Islam there was a ruling, then maybe years later a new ruling came to override it. In the early stages of Islam it was impermissible to go into graveyards. Impermissible to visit the graveyards outside of burial. Impermissible to just go and visit the graveyards. Because in the early stages of Islam, the key was to wipe out every avenue to shirk. And graveyards are one of the biggest avenues to shirk. So the messenger had forbidden them all from going into graveyards, visiting graveyards. But then later on, years later when the aqidah became strong, and the believers were now more established and firm and understood, then the messenger said to them, "Kuntu qad nahaytukum an ziyarat al qubur." That I used to prohibit you from visiting the graves, but then it mentions in one version, "Fal ana zuruha." But now you can visit them, fa innaha tu dakirukum al akhirah, because they remind you of the afterlife. So, that's another example, previously prohibited, afterwards made allowed. So here they say, it was previously prohibited, uh, uh, previously it 
was there. The ruling was there. If you eat camel meat, it breaks your wudu. But then they say later on, another ruling came that indicated that eating camel meat no longer breaks your wudu and you're okay. And therefore they took that opinion. The hadith that they are referring to is the narration in uh, Abu Dawood and An Nasai. And it's an authentic hadith where it says, Kana akhir al amrain minhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tarkul wudu mimma masatin nar. Hadith, authentic. It says, the last of the two positions, the last of the two affairs, what are the two affairs? Eating camel meat breaks your wudu, eating camel meat does not break your wudu. The other two possible options. The hadith says, the final position the messenger took on those two options is that anything that touches the fire does not break the wudu. That you don't have to make wudu from something that has touched the fire. And in that the scholars, some of them, they mention that the camel meat is referenced here. The camel meat, you cook it on the fire and the camel meat itself has that connection to the fire of the shaitan. So they use this narration to say it is an abrogation of having to make wudu from camel meat. The other scholars are going to obviously say this narration is very general. That you don't have to make wudu from anything that has touched the fire. Touched the fire? All of the food that you cook has touched the fire. Touching the fire, all of the food that you cook has touched the fire. The narration is saying there is no need for wudu from that food or whatever has touched the fire or has been contacted by the fire, including therefore the camel meat. That's a very open narration and you're including camel meat into it upon the generality. So the other scholars, they said no. And one of the reasons they said no, we don't accept that is because abrogation is not a first choice or a second choice or a third choice. Abrogation, Islamically in Usul al-Fiqh, you only use it like a last resort. Abrogation is only as a last resort. If it is not proven, if it is proven absolutely, then done, nothing to debate. But when there's a bit of doubt, like this narration now, it's very open in general. Should we use it to abrogate the hadith about camel meat or not? It's very open. In this kind of case then, abrogation would be a last resort. The first resort would be to see if you can combine between the narrations. Is there any way to apply all of the narrations? Because as they say, application of all of the narrations is given precedence over the negation of some of the narrations. If you have multiple narrations, multiple hadith, and they're all authentic, then obviously the first thing you want to try and do is make sure you can apply and implement all of these authentic narrations rather than wiping one out. Wiping one out is going to be the last resort when there's no way to get to a conclusion by combining all of these narrations, it just doesn't work. And there's no other way to make it work. Then you could have a look at maybe these narrations abrogate that one then. So they say we're nowhere near that in this case. We are nowhere near the last resort on this particular topic. They say because you can combine between these narrations easily. They say, Al-Muradu bi tarkil wudu. مِمَّا مَسَّتِ النَّارِ مَا عَدَى لُحُومِ الْإِبِلِ بِدَلِيلِ حَدِيثِ جَابِرُ حَدِيثِ الْبَرَاءِ فَيُحْمَلُ الْعَامِ عَلَى الْخَاصِ أو المطلق على المقيد ومهما أمكن الجمع بين الحديثين فإنه لا يصار إلى النصر They say, look, 
If you can combine between the narrations, that's what you do first. And they say the combination can be made very easily. That anything which is cooked meat, it's being cooked by the fire. This narration tells you it doesn't break your wudu, no problem. A general narration telling you the food cooked upon the fire doesn't break your wudu. Uh, Lamb, chicken, whatever it might be. But then there is another narration telling you specifically that camel meat does break your wudu. So they say one narration is very open and general, and one is very closed and specific. They say put them together. Normally all of the meats etc. cooked by the fire, eat them, it doesn't break your wudu, with the exception of the camel meat, because there's a specific narration about it. They say you can combine like that. Combine like that, the camel meat is a, an exception, the other meats are no problem. And that way you can implement both narrations without having to wipe out one of them. One final point to mention here. So if we now follow the opinion that camel meat breaks your wudu, is it any part of the camel? If you eat any part of the camel that it breaks your wudu, or is it particular parts? As you've seen sometimes maybe on these YouTube videos and things, they cook the full camel. You see the full shape of the camel, it's there, nothing's been chopped off. The full camel is there on the platter. Huge platters for 30 people this big. And the full like baby camel is on that platter. So if you eat any part of that camel from anywhere, does it break your wudu or is it only certain parts of the camel? There is a bit of a difference between the scholars on this. Some of them say it's anything. Anything from the camel, regardless of what part of it breaks your wudu. Others they say, no, it's only the actual meat. Not some of the organs. Some of the organs of animals can be cooked and eaten, kidney, liver, etc. They say it's not really the organs. It's about the actual flesh, the meat. That's what breaks your wudu. Because in the narration it mentioned, أَتَوَضَّأُ min. Luhumil ibil. Do I have to make wudu from camel meat? Whereas those organs, the kidneys, the pancreas, whatever, all those other organs that can also be cooked and eaten, they are not the meat of the camel. Uh, and they give an example. They say, if you said to someone, and in, in Arabic it makes more sense than English, but if you said to someone, go get me some camel meat. Go buy me some camel meat. If you came back with the liver, for example, the liver of the camel, you came back with that. He could argue with you and say, no. I said, give me camel meat. Give me some proper steak, some chunks. This is the liver. This is the heart. This is this. This is that. He could argue that with you. They said, that's legitimate. It's a legitimate argument. So in the hadith, when he said, do I have to make wudu from camel meat? then it means camel meat.
and not these other parts. Even the head, the head of the camel, they may scrape away bits and eat it. They say that doesn't come into the actual meat of the camel, the real flesh of the camel. So some of them say the wudu is only from the real flesh and meat of the camel, the actual uh, 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 chunks of meat, as opposed to the other areas and parts of the camel. But some of them say it's general to everything. That brings us to the end of that section. Uh, uh, we missed that section? Yeah, we should, we should have started with it. Uh-huh. So now, we have one section we missed out in between, which was touching the private parts. We'll just finish that one off now then, before we finish the class. Uh, we were supposed to start on that, I forgot, yes. So now we've done this section, it's no problem, it doesn't matter about the order particularly here. We've now covered vomit, we've covered the, the liquid that comes out before vomit, we've covered nosebleeds, none of those break your wudu. Pre-seminal fluid does break your wudu. Camel meat, difference of opinion there. Most of them, in fact, from the madahib, say it doesn't break your wudu, but most of the scholars of hadith say it does break your wudu. The last thing we'll do now then is, if you touch your private parts, does that break your wudu? Touching the private parts, does that break your wudu? There's a hadith, where a man said, مَسِسْتُ ذَكَرِي أو قال الرجل يمص ذكره في الصلاة أعليه وضوء فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا إنما هو بضعة منك In this hadith a man said that I touched my private area or he mentioned to the messenger what if a man touches his private area during the prayer scratching, maybe you have a scratch or something in that area, for example, and he touches that area, direct contact, not on top of the garment, direct contact with the private area. Then does that break the wudu in this hadith of Talq ibn Ali, radiallahu an? the messenger said, no, that is just another body part. The messenger said, no, that is just another body part. Your hand, your shoulder, your chest, your private parts are just another body part. Doesn't break your wudu if you touch your hand or you touch your shoulder, you touch your head, touch your knees. Doesn't break your wudu if you touch your private part. It's just another part of your body. That's what this hadith says. But then there is another hadith of Busrah bint Safwan, where she said that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ مَسَّ ذَكَرَهُ فَلْيَتَوَضَّأُ That whomsoever touches his private parts, then he has to make wudu. So we have two narrations, one telling us it's just another body part, it doesn't break your wudu. The other telling us, if you touch the private part, then go and make wudu, it's broken your wudu. So clearly we have two opinions here, that means. Clearly we have two opinions on this topic, that means the first opinion is obviously going to be then that the one who touches his private area, then in that case it breaks his wudu, and the other is going to be that the one who touches his private area does not break his wudu. The first opinion in a bit more detail then, that the one who touches his private area, it does not break his wudu. And obviously they are going to use the first hadith, where in that one the messenger said, your private parts are just another part of your body. It's just skin and flesh, another part of your body. Doesn't break your wudu if you made contact. (coughs) That's the hadith that they use, and that is the madhab of the Hanafis. And it is also narrated from Imam Ahmad, in one version that he took this opinion. They say it doesn't break your wudu, just like it wouldn't break your wudu if you touched your hand or your leg or your face. It's just your body. All of it is your body. 
wherever you touch your body doesn't break your wudu even if it's your private area and they say that this narration where the messenger said it's just another part of your body is a stronger narration than the other one where the messenger said if you, if you touch your private parts then make wudu they said no that hadith is nowhere near as strong as this one here so they said this is the one we have to implement this is what we have to apply. And they said also because the default, the default is that touching your body, does it or does it not break your wudu? The default is it doesn't break your wudu. Touch your hand, touch your shoulder, touch your head, touch your leg, touch your private parts, anywhere on your body, the default is it doesn't break your wudu. So then where has this exception come from, they say? It's another part of your body, the messenger said. So that is the first opinion. The second opinion, of course, they say it breaks your wudu because they give precedence to the second narration where it said, if one of you touches your private area, then, then make wudu. But then the issue is going to be what? How do they reply to the first group of scholars? What are they going to say about the hadith that says it's just another body part? Doesn't break your wudu. How are they going to explain that? If they say no, it breaks your wudu. A barrier, all of this discussion is about direct contact. If it's via a barrier over your garment, maybe you scratch that area on top of your garment, that doesn't break your wudu definitely. But this is about direct contact onto the private area. That's something that if a person touches that area with desire as opposed to with no desire, no desire whatsoever, like we mentioned last time, maybe a person has a shower, makes wudu and everything, and afterwards he's drying himself off with his towel and a contact just occurs between his hand and that area. No desire, nothing, just drying himself off with the towel. But somebody else, if their contact was with desire, that may, ha- may make a difference. But also they said, one of their explanations was, the issue of what we just talked about, abrogation. They say, yes, originally in Islam, the ruling was that it doesn't break your wudu if you touch your private parts. But then afterwards a new ruling came, that it does, they say. How can they prove this? They say, Talq ibn Ali qadim al-Madina fi awwal al-Hijra, qabla bina'i masjid al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They say the narrator of the first hadith, where the messenger said, it's just another body part, it doesn't break the wudu. Talq ibn Ali, he was one of the early ones from the early Muslims who came to Medina at the beginning of the Hijrah. Just when the messenger had made Hijrah and gone to Medina, Talq ibn Ali was one of the early Muslims who arrived in Medina at that time. Whereas the narrator of the second hadith, Busra, radiallahu anha, she uh, uh, came into the frame much later on. She wasn't around in those early days. She came much later on. So her narration must have been after the narration of Talq, who was around from the beginning of the Hijra days. Whereas Busra only arrived or, or, or was present much later on in history. وَإِذَا تَعَارَضَ الْحَدِيثَانِ وَكِلَاهُمَا صَحِيحٌ وَلَمْ يُمْكِنَ الْجَمْعِ فَإِنَّ الْمُتَأَخِّرِ يَنْصَخْ الْمُتَقَدِّمِ so then if you have this problem where you cannot combine two narrations, and here it's a very difficult combination, you could argue it's a difficult combination. One hadith saying touching your private part breaks your wudu, the other one saying it doesn't break your wudu. Complete opposites. So they say, look, here is a situation where you would therefore have to make abrogation and say that the second hadith, the later one, abrogates the first one. Uh, and that's a difference of opinion that exists on that topic. The issue of desire is mentioned by some of the scholars or the lack of it. And uh, that, that difference exists and you can examine that and look into it. But that is the general difference on the topic. 
uh, of whether a person's wudu is broken by touching the private area or not. Um, the fatwa that the Sheikh mentions that many of the scholars give uh, is that it does not break your wudu. But of course, the other opinion is a strong opinion also. Uh, and there are scholars, major scholars, once again upon that opinion. So these are differences that exist because of those various narrations. We'll conclude upon that for today.